Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Welcome to my review of Volo's Guide to Monsters. This is the latest supplement for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, put out by Wizards of the Coast. Uh, the recording date for this is November the 16th. Uh, the book officially released on November the 15th, although uh, many uh, local stores were able to get them in advance. Uh, I just picked this up today, so mine just came in. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick flip through the book, just kind of look at some of the uh, the artwork, some of the things that are in there. And then at the end, I'm going to do my full review. So uh, let's start off just a flip through the book itself. All right, so let's just have a flip through the book here. We'll talk about the different uh, chapters included. So uh, what this book is, is it's kind of like their new take on the Monster Manual. Uh, so it's not just the conventional book where it's just filled with monsters and stats. Uh, this is presented in a much more uh, fleshed out way. Uh, the first chapter, which runs from pages 100, or from 1 to, I think it was around 100, 102, is all about um, monster lore. So it goes into different uh, monster types and just gives lots of great information about, about them. So, for example, we got the Beholder here. Uh, we've got uh, information about how to run them, as well as charts on uh, how to randomly create uh, Beholder's appearance uh, from scratch. Uh, I'll get a little bit more into some of the lore information when I get into my final review, but for now we're just kind of doing a flip through. Uh, most sections in the lore section also include a really uh, nice map. Uh, so we got one there for sort of the uh, Beholder layer. Um, and it's just like I said, a lot of really cool information in this. Uh, now it all goes into other creatures as well, so we've got uh, information on giants. Uh, we get go from them to uh, just a second here. Uh, so Knowles is another one that uh, gets mentioned in this, which is really cool because I don't think uh, a lot of stuff really focused on Knowles a lot, uh, even though I really always liked uh, always liked Knowles as monsters in my campaign, so I'm kind of happy to have a little bit more information on them. Uh, we've got Galvanoids, which includes the uh, a little section up here on the Nil Bogs, which I think go all the way back to the uh, first edition AD and D uh, Fiend Folio. I think was where they were. Uh, so they're pretty cool. They have the uh, the stats, uh, the full stats for them later on, which is really sweet. Uh, we got Hags, so it goes into information on Hags as well. So this doesn't cover just the uh, main ones that you would think of. There's a few other uh, creature types that actually get some focus in here, which I really like. So hags being one of them, gnolls being uh, another one. Of course, it does have to go into uh, kobolds and talk a little bit about them. Uh, <clears throat> kobolds names, kobolds layers, which you can see is this huge sort of maze-like thing. Uh, and one of my all-time favorite monsters after the Beholder would be the uh, the mind flare. So the mind flare section does go into detail about uh, you know their how they're born, how they're created, sort of thing, uh, which is something that I always actually really liked. And I even <coughs> wrote an adventure around uh, way back uh, in third edition days uh, involving the the mind flare reproductive uh, system, which is really uh, not as sexual as it may have sounds uh, the way I describe it there. But uh, just some really great information in here. And we, of course, we have orcs, uh, some of their gods, description on tribes, how to roleplay orcs, uh, an orc stronghold, and the auntie. Uh, so another one that uh, doesn't really get a whole lot of focus necessarily in in D and D. Uh, so it's really cool that they introduce them. Of course, we got their temples, and then we get into chapter two, which is all about the player character races. Uh, so we got uh, the Asimar. Uh, Firbolg, which was one that I remember playing a lot of when I used to uh, play characters in 2nd edition AD&D. Uh, a friend of mine had the uh, the handbook that they came in. I want to say it was the Monstrous Humanoids handbook, or the Demi-Human handbook, but anyway, I always used to really enjoy playing uh, Firbolg, so it's cool to see them in there again. Uh, we got Goliaths, uh, Kenku, if you want to be a, uh, a crow person. Uh, and lizard folk, so which is awesome because you know I don't think lizard folk really get enough attention. Uh, and then tabaxi, which are uh, feline characters, so basically if you want to be a cat person. And we got the triton, so for more aquatic themed stuff. So that's all really cool. And then they've got uh, not as fleshed out, not as uh, much description on them, obviously, but uh, it does give some monstrous uh, humanoids uh, that you can play as well. Uh, and unlike the other races before them, uh, some of these races actually have 
uh, a penalty to some stats, which 5th edition doesn't really have for the normal races. Uh, so, for example, if you look at the Kobold, uh, their dexterity score increases by 2, uh, their strength, but their strength score is reduced by 2. Uh, and then it gives their ability. So they've got some of those. We also have the uh, the orc whose strength increases by two, their constitution increases by one, uh, but their intelligence is reduced by two. So <clears throat> unlike previous uh, races in here, some of these monstrous ones actually do have uh, some drawbacks. Uh, and there's, you know you can get the chance to play a uh, Yanti pureblood if you wanted to. Uh, so that's pretty cool as far as introducing some unique uh, races, but of course it's always going to be up to the DM whether they want to allow them or not. And then we just get into our uh, bestiary, which is more of a traditional monster manual approach. So we've got uh, some different beholders, uh, the Bodax, uh, make their return, uh, Boggles, uh, Catobelopus, which I probably pronounced wrong, uh, Cave Fisher, the Great Underdark Monster, uh, Cranium Rats, uh, Darklings, and for anyone who was a Chainmail fan, uh, it actually brings back the, uh, the well, the Maw Demon is the Abyssal Maw, and the uh, Shuzva, uh, which again, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but that looks a lot like the old Abyssal Ravager from, from Chainmail. So it's pretty cool that they uh, reintroduced those uh, monsters. Uh, we got some dinosaurs, we got some, uh, the Frog Hemoth, for those who are fans of Frog Hemoth, which I probably shouldn't be, but I just find them hilarious, so I love them as well. Uh, Fire Giant Dreadnought, just some different uh, different takes on some of the uh, previously released giants. Uh, the Flins, different types of gnolls. Uh, the Grungs, which I'm not really familiar with, so if they're from a previous uh, edition of D&D, please let me know. Uh, they are evil, but they are kind of also adorable, uh, looks like frog people. Uh, we got some hags, hobgoblins. And some kobolds. I actually really like the artworks on the uh, the kobolds. It make them look a lot cooler than they used to way back in the day. Uh, the crotas. Some mind flares, including the elder brain, which is really cool, and the ulrithid, which I've also always really liked. Uh, the neoji, uh, neolithid, <clears throat> and there's the. Uh, oh, let's see if I get a good shot of it. There's the uh, the Nilbog. So I'm not going to really focus on a lot of monsters here, but I kind of want to go over the Nilbog because they are pretty cool. Uh, so they have innate spell casting. Uh, their challenge is one, uh, so they're a bit tougher than regular goblins. Uh, so the spell casting allows them to do Mage Hand, Tasha's Hideous Laughter, uh, Vicious Mockery, and then once per day they can use uh, Confusion. Uh, they have an ability called Nilbogism. Uh, any creature that attempts to damage the Nilbog must first succeed a DC 12 Charisma saving throw or be charmed until the end of the creature's next turn. Uh, a creature charmed this way must use its action praising the Nilbog. Uh, the Nilbog can't regain hit points, including through magical healing, except through its uh, reversal of fortune. Uh, so that's another ability that they have. Uh, well, they have also have Nimble Escape, which allows them to take Disengage or Hide. Uh, and then their reversal of fortune is in response to another creature dealing damage to the Nilbog. Uh, the Nilbog reduces the damage to zero and regains 1d6 hit dice. Uh, so that uses its uh, reaction, I believe, uh, in response to the creature. Uh, I'm going to say that that must use its... Yeah, it's under the reaction section. I don't know why I completely didn't realize that at first. But yeah, so as a reaction it can do that. So once per round it can actually uh, avoid taking damage and uh, regain hit points instead. And then we got some uh, some orcs, some different types of orcs, the Tanaruk, the Quickling, uh, which if any uh, any of you read some of the earlier Salvatore books, uh, Quicklings appeared uh, in some of those. Uh, the Shadow Mastiff, uh, the Spawn of Caius, one of my favorite uh, undead creatures, and uh, the Varagul, which again, I'm probably saying wrong, but pretty cool to see them, Vegapygmies, and Zavarts. So uh, I remember playing uh, Baldur's Gate, uh, the original Baldur's Gate on PC, and running into a lot of these uh, these things. So it's pretty cool that they are in the book as well. And then we just got some uh, Yonti at the end, including the Yonti Ananthema, uh, some other things. And then we got our appendixes. So we got some uh, some beasts if you just need to fill out some things. So uh, you know, cows, uh, rock grub swarms, dolphins. Uh, and then we got some non-player characters, so it's uh, just to kind of flesh out some of the options that were available from the monster manual. 
So we got you know Arch Druid, Bard, uh, Archer, Blackguard, uh, Champion, Conjurer, uh, Diviner, Enchanter, Evoker, Illusionist. So they got the different wizard types. Uh, Kraken Priest. Uh, so that's actually pretty cool. If you wanted to have something uh, nautically themed, uh, Martial Arts Adept, which would be a, uh, a monk, uh, Master Thief, Necromancer, Swashbuckler, uh, Transmuter. War Priest, uh, Warlock of the Archfey, and Warlock of the Fiend, Warlock of the Great Old One, and uh, the Warlord, and then we just kind of got some charts in the back, uh, sorting out uh, encounter types where you would see some of these creatures based on their uh, environment. So that's a flip through of the book, uh, so um, just kind of gives an idea of some of the stuff that's in there, and uh, then what we'll do is I'll just go kind of into my review, go over some of the, uh, the high aspects, some of the... Uh, negatives. Not that there's a lot of uh, negatives to this, but you know I'm going to go over everything in here, and uh, you know hopefully it'll help uh, make your decision if you want to pick this up or not. So we'll go on. Uh, next section will be our review. All right, so we did our flip through, and now I just want to get into my actual opinions and thoughts on the book as a whole. Uh, what's interesting about this book is that it's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's not really a traditional monster manual. Uh, it's got a little bit more information, a little bit more detail in those first hundred and some odd pages. Uh, but what's interesting is that those pages are written as if they're uh, done by a narrator. So it's written from Volo's point of view. Uh, it goes in line sort of with Wizards of the Coast uh, decision that they don't want to have uh, just monster supplements or, you know, things that are just, uh, you know, the rules or, or things like that. So they want to have sort of a flavor and a theme to everything that they have in the book. Uh, in the books that they release, which is which is admirable. It's nice to see that they're incorporating some uh, you know elements of story into even something as you know uh, mundane perhaps as a you know new version of the monster manual. Uh, I think it's really great that they introduce some old school monsters from back in the day, like the uh, the Nilbog. Uh, introduces some chainmail creatures back with the uh, the Abyssal Ravager, the Abyssal Maw. Uh, some other creatures like that, and it goes into a lot of great detail uh, with the the monsters that it spends the time with on its lore chapters. Uh, it's great that they introduce some new uh, some new playable races, and you know the monstrous races are great as well. Uh, interesting that they do have a few of them that have the uh, drawbacks like the kobold and the uh, the orc, which again makes sense for their uh, their races. They don't tend to be orcs don't tend to be the strong or the uh, the smartest, and kobolds don't tend to be the strongest. So it's interesting that they kind of uh, worked in the the racial penalties uh, there for those. Uh, as far as the lore sections itself goes, uh, most of it's uh, pretty well done. I like a lot of it. Uh, one of the things that I didn't really particularly care for was the birthing cycle of the Beholders. Uh, now the reason I say that is in the 3rd edition, or 3.5, uh, they released a book called um, Lords of Madness, which was a book that revolved around aberrations and going into a lot of great detail about them. So the way that uh, Beholders are born in Volo's Guide to Monsters, which I should preface by saying that uh, the book itself uh, alludes to the fact that not all the information is necessarily trustworthy. Uh, so, you know, uh, Volo's version of how Beholders uh, are born may not necessarily be accurate. Uh, but it's the way that they're presented in this book. So it's it's worth noting that uh, you kind of have to take some of this information with a grain of salt. Uh, there's a little section at the very beginning uh, after the introduction by Volo that's just some notes by uh, Elminster, so who's obviously not the fondest of Volo. Uh, so it's just kind of, I guess, worth noting that. But in this book, uh, Beholders essentially dream other Beholders into existence. Uh, so a Beholder goes into a slumber, a deep slumber. Uh, they have... Uh, these unusual or bizarre dreams, and from those dreams, any beholder that they dream in there ends up being willed into existence, uh, <clears throat> which you can have sort of like a beholder hive. If a beholder dreams about being uh, lord over other beholders, uh, then you know you, it creates uh, basically other beholders in its image, and then you have this sort of hive thing. Um, as far as the standard of the writing goes for everything else in this book, it's really fantastic. I find that explanation of how beholders are born to be kind of weak and uh, almost something that, you know, and, and again, I know it's written from the point of view of Volo, but it's just kind of weird that that's how they would go with, with the beholders being created. Uh, for anyone who doesn't have the Lords of Madness book, 
Uh, the way that beholders are created in that, it's kind of gross, uh, but I will go into detail about it. So uh, what the beholders in the, that 3.5 supplement did is they produced asexually. Uh, so they would just eventually at some point in their life become pregnant. Uh, now again, if you look at the beholder anatomy, uh, it doesn't really look like there's places for things like, you know, a traditional womb. So what would happen is the beholder's womb would kind of be underneath and behind its tongue. And as the beholder started gestating these little tiny baby beholders in them, uh, it would actually start to uh, push out its tongue to the point where it would almost uh, distend it completely out of its body. Um, once the, the baby beholders became of age, uh, the mother beholder would uh, actually just kind of bite down and the, uh, the sack that all these baby beholders were being carried in would be uh, severed from the, be the main beholder's body. And then, of course, the baby beholders would have to immediately fend for themselves uh, just because the mother <coughs> would not have been able to eat for several days or even weeks or however long it takes. Uh, so it would become ravenous and instinctively just try to uh, eat as much as it can to regain its strength. So that's kind of how beholders were born in 3.5. I know it's really kind of gross and disgusting, but I still prefer that version over the fact that they simply dream other beholders into existence. Uh, other than that, it is a really solid book. The maps that they have uh, for each of the monster types that they go into uh, are fantastic. Uh, really nicely detailed maps. Uh, the write-ups, other than that one little thing that I've seen so far, uh, is absolutely fantastic and a great way to introduce monster lore into the D&D the D &D game. Uh, and the player character race is always nice to have a few more options and to bring back some some classics, like the, the Fur Bulk, for example. And it's nice to have uh, the Asimar, which is sort of the opposite of the, uh, the Tiefling. So uh, all around, this is an absolutely fantastic book. Uh, I do enjoy having it. I'm glad that I finally uh, picked my copy up. A little disappointed that my copy came with a little bit of damage on the cover there uh, when I got it at the store, but not much I could do about that. Unfortunately, I'm not going to really dedicate you know money to, to buying another copy of this, but... Uh, really enjoyed this book. I think it's fantastic. It's got some great information there. Uh, if you want to run campaigns with some of the monsters that it dedicates the lore chapters to, uh, the information contained in there is very valuable for fleshing out things like uh, orc uh, encampments, uh, knoll bands, uh, beholder colonies, uh, it's just about anything uh, that's mentioned in those chapters. A lot of great information on there for uh, it's nice that they have some expanded options for NPCs in the book uh, towards the back, uh, including breaking down a lot of the different uh, wizard types. So if you didn't want to have just a conventional generic wizard, you can have one that's more specialized. So if you want someone that specializes in evocation, you have sort of a ready-made one here, which is, uh, which is great. Uh, the different fighter types in there as well. Uh, and I like the fact that they have a warlord in there. That kind of goes back to one of the old 4th edition classes that I really absolutely loved. Uh, so there's a lot of great information in this book. Uh, in my opinion, it's absolutely worth it. And if this is the way that they're going to present uh, supplements in the future, then I think they have a winning formula. Uh, now, I actually do plan on recording a video here later in the week uh, about supplements. Um, so I'm going to do that a little bit later on. But as far as a D&D 5th edition supplement goes, this is the, the best one that's been released to date. And uh, I consider it to be sort of an all-around, well-rounded supplement. My only real beef with it aside from that little beholder thing, which is more of a petty preference. Uh, but my actual kind of problem with this is that uh, where it does have the player character races in there, uh, players may feel obligated to buy this book in order to have access to those races. Uh, so if you're a DM and you're looking to, uh, to introduce some of the elements in this, highly recommend letting your players know that. Um, the issue is that if players feel obligated to buy this book, then they're going to have access to all the same information, all the same monster stats, uh, all the same uh, monster lore. So they're going to have the ability to read all that. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure if having the player races in this book was such a great idea. Um, I think it would have been better served to have introduced them a lot sooner and maybe even going as far back as uh, Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide probably should have been where all the races were in. That way you could have a book that uh, was geared more towards the players than that and you could uh, dedicate the extra pages for the player character races that are in this 
uh, to some more monster theme stuff. So maybe uh, go into an ecology of something like dragons, which are uh, suspiciously absent from this. Um, there's actually no uh, information on dragons at all. So, it, you know, they could have taken out a few pages of the player character races, put them in an earlier release, and focus solely on DM specific information for this book. And I think it would have uh, completely knocked it out of the park. So that's the one negative that I have about it. Uh, but other than that, it is absolutely a fantastic book. Well written, well designed, and I do highly recommend this uh, for, for DMs out there, for players. Um, be careful if you end up getting this just for the races. Uh, my recommendation is if you know you're in a campaign with, you know, that may be centered around things like beholders or giants or orcs or whatever, uh, try not to read the information uh, on them in the book. Maybe skip over things that you know your DM's using at this point in time, and uh, in but otherwise enjoy the rest of it. Uh, so that's my review of uh, Volo's Guide to Monsters. I hope it was helpful. I'll provide some insights for you. Uh, like I said, I give it a solid recommendation. So until next time, uh, keep uh, keep on gaming, and uh, hopefully you tune in for my next video, which is going to be all about uh, how I want to see uh, future releases be uh, handled from Wizards of the Coast. So until then, YouTube.